Okay, let's pray. Lord Jesus, we bless you and we worship you. We thank you for being in our midst and walking among us. Lord, you are the one who holds the key of David, who unlocks doors that no one can close, closes doors that no one can open. And I'm asking you, Lord Jesus, to insert the key of David into our hearts and unlock places inside of us that nobody else can open and open them to yourself. I ask, Lord, that you will walk among us and touch our hearts by your Spirit who lives in us. Father, I'm asking you that you will grant to us a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of yourself and your Son. I pray that you will enlighten and flood our hearts with light so that we could see through the eyes of faith into your heart for us as your people. I thank you for everyone who has come these nights and for these that are here tonight. Thank you for them, Father, for their giving of their time and their, their lives and their effort just to be here. And I thank you and bless you for them. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, we are in part three of the Tabernacle of David in your notes. We can turn right there. <clears throat> um, I spent quite a bit of time last night talking about the significance of the Ark of the Covenant in that it represents the throne of God and the glory of His person and being and the glory of His presence, manifest, substantial, real, and tangible. But ultimately, the Ark speaks to us of the person of Jesus in whom the fullness the totality and plentitude of deity permanently dwells in bodily form. That just freaks me out. I, I read that and I just, I just can't hardly even handle that. The fullness of deity, the totality and plentitude of the entire Godhead dwells in Jesus Christ in bodily form. <clears throat> Talk about God wanting to be among his people. Wow. <clears throat> he is the glory of God. Hebrews chapter 1, let's open there. If I get in here, I may never get out. <laughs> we may abandon ship right here in three verses. But I, can't, I won't do it. I, I won't do it unless I'm under divine edict. But everything in me will want to do it, trust me. <clears throat> God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers and the prophets, in many portions and in many ways, in the last of these days, has spoken to us with finality in a son whom he appointed heir of all things through whom also he made the world or framed the ages. And he is, and actually the Greek says, who being by nature, who being by nature, you can have he is if you want to, I prefer who being by nature, 
who being by nature, in other words, this is not something that he became. This is not something that was added to him. This is who he is by nature. Humanity was added to him, but this was not added to him. This is not in reference to his incarnation. This is in reference to his eternal existence, who being by nature the radiance of his glory. And I think after studying this for many, 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 many years, the best translation that I can give to you of that is, who being by nature the sole radiant expression of his glory. And we don't have what we had up on the board last night, but if you could just remember what we had up on the board, glory was goodness, all of the words that, that are tied to that Hebrew word, uh, tov, meaning his gladness and his preciousness and his, his joyfulness and his delightfulness and his beauty, his correctness and his rightness, and then all of the seven uh, attributes and characteristics that he went on to explain to Moses that are part of his glory, i.e. his goodness. The writer to the Hebrews is saying that this one who is the Son is by nature the sole radiant expression of all that we had up on the board and all that God said to Moses. Jesus is the radiant expression of that one. <clears throat> and then when he came here, even though that was the, the, the radiant splendor of it, the brightness of it, because glory also has to do with light, even though the radiant splendor, the outraying, the effulgence, if you will, which was only seen one time, and that's on the Mount of Transfiguration. They got a glimpse of it when he, when he was transfigured, when God the Father lit him up from the inside out and let the, the veil of his flesh be penetrated by the, by the, the radiant outraying of the glory of God that he is. They saw him as he will be seen when he returns. But even though he was veiled in flesh, John says, still we beheld his glory. And of course, he was talking about the characteristics of the nature and the person of God's being that Jesus manifested when he was here among us. And so he is the sole radiant expression of the glory of God. And so we can say without any reservation, He is the glory of God. He's the glory of God expressed. But not only is He that, the writer says He, he is the exact representation of His nature. And uh, let's see. Um, some say that He is the reproduction of His essence. That's Kenneth Wiest, the way Wiest writes it. Um, I don't like any of those translations, personally. <clears throat> I mean, they're good and they're close. They're good and they're close. But I don't think that they're right. Because the word that the writer uses here for um, exact representation actually means, means an imprint or impress. He is the character, the Greek word is, he is the character. And a character in Greek terms was a, a stamp. Like when a king had a signet ring on and they, they were sending out a, a scroll and they would put a wax seal on it and he would affix his signet ring to the wax. He was making, he was taking the ring that was the character and he was leaving an exact impression, an exact imprint, an exact stamp. And it's also used of, of the dyes that were used to make coins, um, which are still being used today. 
to, to make coins. And, and so the word that the writer uses is that he is by nature also the imprint, the impress, and the stamp or the character of his, the father's, and this is where it gets a little tricky trying to figure out how to translate this word. That's why some have called it the representation of his nature. Uh, some call it the reproduction of his essence. But I believe that the right way to translate the word is he is, he is the impress, imprint, character of his reality and substance of being. And that's why I put that up there last night. That comes from this translation. Um, the reality and substance of his being. And so the reality about, about the Son of God is that, is that He is identical to the Father, but He is the one who is the imprint, but He's also the expression. He's the impression, and He's also the expression. He is the one that is the glory of God manifest. All things do not come from the Son of God. Romans chapter 11 verses 33 through 36 end with Paul saying, For out of Him, talking about the Father, for out of Him and through Him and unto Him are all things. He's talking specifically of the Father. All things come out of the Father as a source. But all things that, the, that have come out of the Father as the source are done through the agency of the Son of God. That's why it says here in, the, in verse 2, um, through whom? Not out of whom He made, all, all, uh, made the worlds or framed the ages, but through whom? And you will find that consistently in the writings of the New Testament. <clears throat> You'll never find in reference to creation... Any of the writers, and there are three of them, John does it, Paul does it, and the writer to the Hebrews does it here. <clears throat> You'll never see any of them say that the creation came out of the Son. Because the creation came out of the Father who is the blueprint maker of all things. And the Son actually is the co-creator, the one through whom the Father framed the ages. So he's the one that gives expression invisible terms to the invisible reality, the invisible transcendent reality of God's being. Amen. He gives expression. So he is the actual outrage. And one translation says he is the effulgence because that word there, that word there has to do with the, the rays of the sun. You have the sun and then you have the rays that the sun gives. Well, the rays are the effulgence. The sun is the source, but the rays are, are the expression of the sun, even, even in the same way as the sun to the Father. So, <clears throat> ultimately, the ark speaks of the person of Jesus Christ. I gave you some other scriptures. We won't even look at them. <clears throat> um, they're there for you. David's passion. Until I find a place for the Lord. That that one thought, even though we haven't read very much of Psalm 132, I want to encourage you to make that one of your favorite psalms. Make that one of your favorite psalms. I once had the privilege of going to a, a retreat in, uh, in Minnesota. This was back in 1977. And I heard a, I heard a team of musicians stand up and sing one, Psalm 132. And the song was one of the most anointed songs I've ever heard in my life. I and mean, I can still hear it in my, in my heart and in my ear. Lord, remember David and all of his afflictions and how he swore to the Lord and vowed unto the mighty God. Surely I will not sleep nor give slumber to my eyelids until I find a place for the That's why we can say this is not about us. This is not about us. This is not about our ministries. This is not about our destinies. This is about finding a place 
for the Lord. Lord, I want you to have a place, first of all and foremost, here. Here, in this inner sanctuary that you have made me to be. I know that the scriptures say, and most translations read, do you not know that you are the temple of the Holy Spirit and that God's Spirit dwells in you? And I also know that it says that your body is a temple. That's the way it's translated in English, but there are two Greek words <clears throat> that are translated temple. One word has to do with temple proper, the proper structure of Solomon's temple. That's the Greek word, heiron. But there's another word that has to do with the inner sanctuary that has to do with the Holy of Holies. And that's the Greek word, naos. And in every place in the New Testament, <clears throat> every place in the New Testament that talks about <clears throat> us being a dwelling place for God in Ephesians chapter 2, where it says in, in uh, I'll give you the, the references in a minute, when it says it in 1 Corinthians uh, 3 and 6, two different times, where it's, ten, it's, it's translated temple, the way that it should be, that it should read is the Naas is the inner sanctuary, which means or dwelling of God. And what Paul is saying is, do you not know <clears throat> that you yourself are a holy of holies? Do you not know that you are an inner sanctuary? You're not a temple. You're an inner dwelling place of God. Amen. You are an inner dwelling place of God himself. Wow. So we have... An inner dwelling place, an inner dwelling place, an inner dwelling place, and a bunch of inner dwelling places, and then here, and then here. And all of you are also living stones because the living stone dwells inside of every one of the living stones. Yes, the living stone, the one who is the living stone that Jacob saw, by the way, back in chapter eight, uh, 28 of Genesis, when he made himself a pillow. And he took a took a, a sleep over the overnight. He laid his head down on on a, on a, a single pillar, and he had a dream and he had a revelation of the house of God. And he turned that pillar up, uh, up stood it up straight, and he poured he poured oil on it, and it ran from the top. It was a single stone. It wasn't a bunch of stones. It pours the oil out, and it runs down from the top of the stone all the way down to the ground. And he says. This is the house of God. And so he has this fantastic revelation. That's the first of seven revelations in the Bible about the house of God. That's number one, Jacob's revelation at Bethel. And out of one single living stone that is anointed, he makes all of us, every single one of us, living stones because we, like he was, our inner dwelling places and inner sanctuaries of the Holy Spirit. Listen, this room is not a sanctuary. I don't care how many times you call it a sanctuary, how many times you refer to it as a sanctuary, this is not a sanctuary. You are a sanctuary. We are a sanctuary, but this is not a sanctuary. This is a, a meeting place. This is an auditorium. This is something. Call it whatever you want to. But it's not a sanctuary. Okay. A place for the Lord. And let us bring back the ark of our God to us, for we did not seek it in the days of Saul. First Chronicles 13.3 The crying passion of David's heart was for the person and presence of God to be in the very midst of the people. And that unceasing prayer and intercession be made. And praise and worship be ascribed to him through the appointed slash anointed priests who served as gatherers of the people to demonstrate and lead the people in offering sacrifices of praise to the God of Israel. 
Now let's turn to First Chronicles. And uh, we'll go to chapter um, 15. Now we started off uh, last night in chapter 13 and we just mentioned a few things. I took off uh, off on verse 6 and, and away we went on the name. Um, but you know the story, most of you do, I'm sure, that David, they tried to bring the ark up on a new cart and uh, the ark tilted somehow and Uzzah put his hand forth to touch and stay the ark. And when he touched it, the Lord struck him down. Why? Because they did not do it according to the prescribed order that Moses had given to the Levites, that they were to carry the ark on their shoulders. And uh, the, Lord, the Lord killed that man because of, of that. And David was angry at the Lord that day. Um, in verse, uh, or he was afraid of God. Verse 11, he was angry. Verse 12, he was afraid. <laughs> yeah. I would think. I would think. He was angry and then he was afraid. David was afraid of God that day. That's not a bad thing, by the way. I know he loves us and I know he's loved, but I want to tell you something. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. That's Bible. Right? That's in your Bible. We you know that, right? It's a fearful thing. <laughs> Been as magnificent and wonderful as he is. You don't want him as an enemy. Come on. And you don't want to be guilty of presumption and presumptuous sins. So anyway, just as a simple point, we all know the point, but we'll just say it anyway to get it on the record. You can attempt to do the right thing for God and do it in the wrong way. And God will not bless it. You can attempt to do the right thing for God and do it in the wrong way. And God will not bless it. Okay, chapter 15. <clears throat> I want to give you seven uh, parts of David's tabernacle and what it includes. And it's all, all here in... 1 Chronicles 15, chapter 15 through chapter 16, verse 6, and then again in chapter 25, verses 1 through 8. There are seven parts. Number one is that there, in David's tabernacle includes, number one, a prepared place. I'll just read the note that we have here. The place that David prepared was Mount Zion, which corresponds to the heavenly Mount Zion, and heavenly Jerusalem, which is recorded for us in Hebrews 12, 18 through 25. It also corresponds to the church universal, and it also corresponds to every local expression of the church. The heavenly is a picture of the earthly, universal, and every local expression of the the church that God has prepared a place for himself and the place is to bring heaven down to earth and to bring earth up to heaven to bring the realities of heaven down to earth so the church universal is supposed to be busy about doing what Thy will be done, thy, ki thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So, the place where God is supposed to be in the midst of his people and dwell and have the freedom to express himself is among his people. This is not about us having the freedom to express ourselves. This is about the Spirit of God who lives in every one of us having the freedom to express Himself. And by the way, the Holy Spirit is the voice of the Father and the voice of the Son who lives inside of you. He is the voice. 
Jesus said it very simply. It's very plain. He will not speak out of himself. It reads on his own initiative, but that's not the right translation. The right translation is, he will not speak out of himself as a source. But whatever he hears, that is what he will speak. And so even as Jesus didn't speak anything on his own initiative or out of himself, even so the Holy Spirit does not speak anything out of himself. What he hears, he speaks, and what he hears and he speaks, he speaks to you. And therefore, whatever he speaks to you, you are as responsible to speak as he is responsible to speak. As Jesus was responsible to speak. Listen, I've been around charismania since like 1970. One. One. <clears throat> I've been around it for a long, long time. And what I'm amazed by is how many people in the in the charismatic Pentecostal part of the church have never prophesied in their lives. Now, I don't say this to condemn anyone, because God knows I don't have that in my heart. But I just find it, like, amazing. <clears throat> Prophecy is the easiest of all of the gifts to operate in. Well, how does it work? Well, it works real simply. The Holy Spirit hears what the Father and the Son are saying. And he speaks that into your heart. And then he nudges you and he says, tell them this. And then you say to him, like I did one time, after he already told me, I said, well, what do you want me to tell them? And all he said was, just tell them what I just told you. That's all it is. Just, you don't have to like make anything up. You don't have to add anything to it. You don't have to take anything. You don't have to explain it. All you have to do is just tell them what I just said to you. That's it. That's all you have to do. God wants a prophetic people. And what that means is he wants his people to prophesy. He wants every one of you to prophesy. And you can all prophesy. Paul said it very plainly. You can. But it's always amazed me. And so I just want to encourage, encourage us. Listen, the Holy Spirit lives in you. He's hearing. The Father is talking. The Son is talking. They're not always talking. Maybe Jeremiah thinks they're always talking. I don't know. I don't have that kind of relationship. But I just know that, you know, that I go through you know, seasons of like real quiet. It's, he's not saying anything. There are times when I ask him questions and he just tells me, you don't have to wait on that. Come on. <clears throat> but, listen, he speaks. And when he speaks, it's like one thing. But when he says, I want you to tell them this. I want you to tell him this. I want you to say this now. Okay. Then it just becomes a matter of us just simply doing what? Just doing what he's asking us to do. Okay. So it's a prepared place. Then secondly, it's a pitched open face tent and tabernacle. The tabernacle corresponds to the true tabernacle in heaven. Let me give you the scripture, Hebrews 8, 1 and 2. Hebrews 8, 1 and 2. And I want to turn to that. Hebrews 8, 1 and 2. Because I don't want to assume that everybody knows what I'm talking about or knows these scriptures. Hebrews 8. Verse 1. Now the main point in what had, has been said is this. Okay, so the writer himself is giving you a summation for everything that he's written so far through seven chapters. The main point in what has been said is this. We have a high priest, such a high priest, who has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne 
of the majesty in the heavens. Wow. That's the main point. You know what's amazing to me is how little is known in the body of Christ about the priesthood of Jesus. If you don't understand the priesthood of Jesus, you will never understand your own priesthood. Because your priesthood is directly linked to the priesthood of the Son of God. Amen. It has Him as its source, and it takes its rise out of His own person as our High Priest, who has passed through the heavens and taken His seat at the right hand of the throne of the Majesty in the heavens. But what is He doing there? Verse 2. A minister, a servant. Now, there are uh, several different words that are used in the New Testament that are translated at different times, servant and minister, but this is a pretty unique one. <clears throat> because this word is always tied to worship. And so this word can be translated a worshiping minister or a worshiping servant or, this, or a servant of worship. So there he is, a high priest, and he is a worshiper. What? Jesus is a high priest and he's a worshiping servant. Wow. In the sanctuary and in the true tabernacle, the real, genuine, authentic tabernacle, which the Lord pitched and not man. For every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices, hence it is necessary that this high priest also have something to offer. And we know that what he offered was himself as our high priest, as we talked about last night. And so... The tabernacle then corresponds to the true tabernacle in heaven in the presence of the Father, where Jesus, our forerunner, you could just jot down Hebrews 6, 19 through 20 there if you want to. That's where that reference comes from. Has entered within the veil which no longer exists. He has given us free and open access by his new and living way. The new and living way references Hebrews 10, 19 through 22. The new and the living way, the freshly slain and ever living way into the Father's presence. But it's also, it also corresponds to the corporate many member house comprised of living stones. We just talked about that. And every individual living stone is in himself a temple, dwelling place, inner sanctuary of the Holy Spirit. And those the two passages would be 1 Corinthians 3.16 and 6.19. 1 Corinthians 3.16 and 6.19. Number three. <clears throat> it was a consecrated priesthood. If we could go back to, to 1 Chronicles. Chapter 15. And let's just read. Now David built houses for himself in the city of David. And he prepared a place for the ark of God. And he pitched a tent for it. Those are the first two points. It's a prepared place, and, and it's a place of a pitched tent and tabernacle. Then David said, No one is to carry the ark of God but the Levites, for the Lord chose them to carry the ark of God and to minister to him forever. <clears throat> David assembled all Israel at Jerusalem to bring up the ark of the Lord to its place which he had prepared for. It. And then we drop down to verse 12. <clears throat> David called Zadok and Abiathar the priests and for, and for the Levites and said to them, You are the heads of the father's households of the Levites. Consecrate yourselves, both you and your relatives, that you may bring up the ark of the Lord God of Israel to the place that I have prepared for it. <clears throat> Excuse me. So number three is it has a consecrated priesthood. Now, I just want to stop and say this. While in David's tabernacle, 
The priesthood was limited to the tribe of Levi, from which also comes the Aaronic high priesthood. When it comes to application in our lives, it's not limited to a tribe, because every single one of us are priests unto the Lord. Every one of us as believers are priests to the Lord. And so the Levitical priests were told to consecrate yourselves that you may be able to bring up the ark of the Lord God of Israel. <clears throat> the Old Testament priests were always set apart by three things. By blood, water, and oil. Corresponding to the blood of Jesus sprinkled in our hearts. The washing of the water of the word of God. And three, the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Um, I just want to say something about the sprinkling of blood. Um, charismatics are known for saying and praying things like, cover me in the blood. I don't know what that means. I don't have any idea what that means. Because I don't find any kind of a biblical reference for that whatsoever. You don't need a bath in the blood of Jesus. Because his blood is so powerful that all you need for all of the sins of your entire life is a single drop of his blood sprinkled into you. And if you need to be cleansed or washed at any given time and you are in need of the blood of Jesus, all you need is a sprinkling of his blood. It, it, the word baptizo is never used to baptize, to immerse. That word is never used concerning blood. It's used concerning water. When we, when we get baptized in water, we're supposed to be baptized by immersion. That word is used of ships that sink to the bottom of the ocean. They're completely identified with the ocean. Why? Because they're sunk. And they're down at the bottom. And they've got water and all everything and water all around. They're completely submerged and immersed. But the Greek word rontizo, which means to sprinkle, is the word that's used regarding the blood of Jesus. God only needs to sprinkle the blood of Jesus. That's how powerful the blood of Jesus is in our lives. And if you read Hebrews chapter 10, that's what the writer says there. The sprinkling of the blood. The sprinkling of the blood of Jesus. And so they were cleansed by blood. They were cleansed by water. And they were cleansed by oil. The priests were. This they were to do as individuals for themselves. And each one was responsible both for himself and those of his household. So there is an individual responsibility in our lives to keep ourselves consecrated and set apart for our priestly duties before the Lord. We need to be set apart. We need to understand that there's two parts to being set apart. Number one is we are set apart from things and we are set apart on two things. You can't be set apart to God unless you have been set apart from the things that are not God. There are so many people walking around in the body of Christ trying to serve the Lord, but they've got, they've got feet in both, in both camps. You know, part of the week they walk in the world and they do the things of the world and all the things that are part of the world. And then on, you know, late Saturday night or early Sunday morning, they get up and they say, oh, I'm going to the house of the Lord and I need to get cleaned up, you know, so I take a shower and spray my armpits and whatever and, and ask God to give me a bath in the blood of Jesus so I can go in there and sing some tunes and make him happy. That's not how it works. That's not being set apart. That's not being set apart. Being set apart means from 
from Monday until Sunday, I live a life that is sanctified, consecrated, set apart unto God, so that when we come together with the people of God, we've been walking in the Spirit, we've been fellowshipping with Him, enjoying His presence, reading our Bibles. <laughs> reading our Bibles. That corresponds with the water, the water, the washing of the water of the Word of God. You know, I, I would, I mean, I would be, I would like to do a poll sometime. I wish somebody would do a poll, but people would just lie. Of how many Christians go from Sunday to Sunday and never crack open their Bibles a month? Oh, by the way, your phone is not your Bible. Your phone is not your Bible. I know you can get Bible apps. I got a Bible app on mine, too. When I'm in a pinch. When I'm in a pinch, like when I don't have my, my Bible in my hand and I need to look up something. But when I'm going to be before the Lord... And I'm going to study his word and read and read the scriptures for real. I have my Bible. Open my Bible. But I like to see a poll of how many believers go week by week and they never crack open their Bibles. How in the world do we think that we're going to walk in a clean way in our lives if we don't expose ourselves to the scriptures and to the word of God? And we live in an era. Now I'll give you permission to use all the electronics you want to. We, we live in an era where you can access so much biblical information on your computer or your phone that it's just unbelievable. I mean, it's, it's unbelievable what people can look up on their phones. Biblical information, commentaries. You can get Kittles, 12,000 words of volumes of material at, just at your fingertips if you want to study this or study that, or Kyle and Delich if you want to look at Hebrew, or commentaries on any book of the Bible that you want to. I mean, you can access them, you can buy them, you can read them for free. It's unbelievable. And yet, <coughs> Our Bibles just remain like, there it, there it is, right where I, where I left it when I came home from the meeting last Sunday. Saints, listen, we need to be consecrated. I just want to tell you, read your Bible. My mother in the Lord who's gone home to be with the Lord now, but every time that woman ever called me on the phone, and whether I... I was real near her. Twenty years had gone by since since uh, you know I last saw her. When she called me on the phone, she said, "Chris, this is Mary." I said, "Mary?" She said, "Yeah, this is your mother in the Lord." I said, "Oh, Mary, I didn't even know you were still here. I'm sorry." She said, "I just have one question I want to ask you." I said, "What is it, Mary?" She said, "Are you in the Word? Are you in the Word?" Are you in the Word? That's all she wanted to know because she knew that if I said yes, that meant something. And if I told her no, that meant something altogether different. We need to walk up to one another and say to each other, hey, are you in the Word? Are you in the Word? In the Word. Did I say world? Oh, are you in the world? No, not are you in the world. Are you in the Word? Or are you in the Word? Hey, give me something... Give me, tell me something to encourage my soul from the Word. Just give me something. Tell me something. <clears throat> Consecrated by the blood and by the water and by the oil, the anointing of God. Listen, listen. People who keep their lives clean and people who, who read the scriptures and people that are, that are, that are seeking the Lord, that you don't have to worry about the, the, the anointing, the, the anointing. The anointing is the, the, the indwelling Christ in you. The indwelling Christ, he just, he just allowed to flow. Why? Because there's, 
there's a free passage and there's, a, there's an ability to, to manifest himself. And so these priests were, you know, they were consecrated. If they were to tend to the holy sacred duties and responsibilities of ministry before God, they had to be sanctified, consecrated, and set apart for such service. Number four, a divinely prescribed order, 15, 13 through 15. Uh, David says, because you did not carry it at the first, the Lord our God made an outburst on us, for we did not seek him according to the ordinance. So the priests and Levites consecrated themselves to bring up the ark of the Lord God of Israel. And the sons of the Levites carried the ark of God on their shoulders with the poles thereon, as Moses had commanded according to the word of the Lord. There was a divinely prescribed order, along with the prescribed order of Moses' directives, as to carrying the ark, David then instituted other orders, directives, and instructions for the functioning of the priest before the Lord day and night. The New Testament speaks of doing all things decently and in an orderly rank and file fashion, because God is not the author of confusion, chaos, anarchy, and a charismatic free-for-all. While there's wonderful freedom of expression, both of gifts and talents, it's not a license for people to do as they please, however they please. Every river has its own banks. I don't think that's ever going to be a problem here among you. But I have to tell you that I've been in places where, where people thought that being free in the spirit meant a charismatic free for all, and it's not. Every river has its banks, and we all know what happens when rivers overflow their banks or oceans overflow their shores. There's nothing but devastation and trouble. God has given a prescription for how the gifts of the Spirit should operate, how our gatherings should be, and we need to pay attention. But David also had some things that he laid down as, uh, as orders for the worshipers that we'll talk about in, in just a minute. Then number five, <clears throat> a divinely appointed slash anointed team of worshipers. Chapter 15, verses 15 through 28. Okay, so let's look at verse uh, 16. David spoke to the chief, chiefs of the Levites to appoint their relatives, the singers, with instruments of music. Harps, lyres, loud sounding, sounding cymbals to raise sounds of joy. Wow. That's what I'm talking about. The Levites appointed Heman and Asaph and Ethan. Now these guys, their names have, have really interesting meanings, by the way. And with them, their relatives for the second rank, and then he goes on. And then verse 19, the singers Heman, Asaph, and Ethan. Heman means faithful in service. Asaph means gatherer of the people, and Ethan means permanent. And then verse 22, and Kenaniah, which means Jehovah has planted, chief of the Levites, was in charge of the singing. He gave instruction in singing because he was skillful. He gave instruction in singing because he was skillful. Okay, so let's just talk about some things. You have these people who are set apart. They're appointed by David. They're obviously also anointed by God. But they're not just there to minister to the Lord. They're also there to teach and to instruct and to guide and give direction to other people. And so God has people who, who have... Um, various levels of ability and skill and some of them are appointed and anointed to do what to give instruction in singing to give instruction in playing to give instruction in flowing to give instruction in, in being prophetic to give instruction in all the things that have to do with the tabernacle of david listen there have to be forerunners. There have to be people that, that get it. There have to be people who understand. 
There have to be people to whom God has given insight and revelation as to how this works and what this looks like. And those are the people that God will use to give others instruction. And if we are not willing to receive instruction, if we are not willing to take correction, if we're not willing to, to receive teaching, if we're not willing to be challenged to step up our own skills, our own abilities, and, 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 and learn how to function better um, in, in flowing in the Spirit of God, then we will then disqualify ourselves from being able to participate because of the stubbornness of our own hearts. I've known people who, <clears throat> who when talking about these things, they, they get this rod, they get this rod inside of their, their, from their backbone, from the top of their heads to the balls of their feet, and they're like, we've never done this before, I've never done this, I don't want to do this, I'm not going to do that, uh, this is weirdness, this, I, I never heard of this before, I don't know what, I, I, and they get this thing on them that comes on them. And it comes from a lot of different places within. But because they won't submit in their hearts to, to just humble themselves and say, you know what? I, I may not understand what you're talking about. I may not be able to do right now what you're trying to teach me. Um, it seems weird. It makes me feel really, really self-conscious. What if I mess it all up? What if I make a fool out of myself? What if I, what if I, what if I, whatever. They, and, and, but they finally can come to a place where they say, you know what? Even though all that stuff might be true, I can see that this is what God is doing. This is what God is saying. And because it's what the Lord wants, then whatever part it is that I'm supposed to play, please teach me. Please help me. Please instruct me. Please show me. Yes. I told you the first night that I talked this stuff that when those brothers came down from Tampa and I was the song leader, and I'm not kidding, you know, we used to sing our songs from the hymnals. And when I tell you that I used to do the, you know, the, and, I, and I used to do this and lead the, you know, lead, and we'd sing. I mean, that's all we knew. That's all we knew. These guys came down and they were, you know, they were prophetic, man. They were like in another dimension. They were in another realm. I thought they came from another world. And, and they grabbed me since, you know, since I was on staff and, and teaching in the Bible college and I was the song leader. They said, hey, we want you to come in with us. Let's show you some, some things. And they got up on the platform and they started playing the keyboard and they got the guitar going and the drums going and they started doing some stuff up there, man. And I was like, what are you guys doing? And I'm like, this is just Tabernacle of David. I said, well, I don't understand anything about that. And then they started saying, no, man, you prophesy on the instrument. And here's what it looks like. And the guy just said, listen, I'm going to start playing. I'm going to ask the Spirit of the Lord to come and make me his instrument. And play my instrument through me. And all of a sudden, the Spirit of God, I mean, I could, I could sense the tangible presence of God show up in that auditorium. And he started playing, and I'm like, and I was like, hey, did, have you ever played that before? Did, he said, no, I, that just came to me just right now. It just happened right now. And I was like, really? He was like, yeah, that happens all the time. I was like, really? And then this guy starts singing something. I'm like, where is that coming from? He says, no, it's just coming from the Spirit of the Lord. We're worshiping the Lord. And, and I could hear him sing, urging me to sing this out. And as I sing this out, then I, this, he drops this in my heart and my mind. I just start singing that out. And then I just start prophesying. And then he starts to prophesy to me. He's singing. He's saying, you're going to prophesy. He started singing this stuff to me. And I'm like, oh my God, what are you doing? Then they said, hey, wait, you need to come up up here and grab a microphone. I'm like, dude, I am not coming up there. I'm not grabbing anything. I'm staying right where I am. And they said, no, no, you need to come up here. Listen, there's nobody else here but us. Just come up here with us. The Spirit of God will fall on you. Come up. So I was like, man, everything inside of me was like, no, God, I'm not doing that. I don't want to do this. But I went up there, you know what? And I just stood there with the microphone in my hand. I just stood there and I was just like, I'm 
was listening to the music. And listen, he said, listen, you can, you'll start to hear a melody in your heart to the, to the chords that we're playing. It'll come to you. There's, there'll be a melody that'll come. You'll, you'll hear it. You'll sense it. And whatever you hear, just start humming the melody. And I, sure enough, man, I started hearing something. I started humming. Said, yeah, that's good. And so I said, put some words to it. I'm like, what words? are like, I don't know. Make something up. So I was like, I don't know. Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. Started singing it. And you know what? The Spirit of God came and fell on me, and, and I was literally transformed in a day. And they stayed with me for a week. They stayed with me for a week. And the following Sunday, they were on the platform. And they had me up on the platform. And from the week before, we were singing from the hymnals. And this week, this Sunday, we didn't even, like, we didn't teach it. We didn't introduce it. We just went out there and blew people's brains out. <laughs> they were looking at like, what are we, what hymn are we singing? We say, we're not using hymnals anymore. They're going out the window. They're going out the door. You're talking about a radical transformation. We're talking about something like right now. We weren't fooling around. Amen. You know what? I could have like just said no. And I, there was a part of me that did say it. No. But you know what? God wanted something else. Amen. And you know what? If he could take this fool and do it, he can do it with anybody. He can take any of us. Our hearts just have to be done. A divinely appointed and anointed. These priests of the Lord were separated, appointed, and anointed. Highly skilled and trained. And very prophetic musicians. Highly skilled and trained. And very prophetic musicians. The names of the leaders give us insight into God's view of who and what they were. And to what he was calling them. The combined names. The com combined meanings of the names of the primary worship leaders. Heman, Asaph, Jeduthun, Ethan, and Kenaniah. Means... Jehovah has permanently planted those faithful in service to gather the people to form a choir of praise and worship. There are people that God has called. Is it not in your notes? Is it not in your notes? Yeah. Yeah, it's in your notes. It's in number five. It's in bold. It's emboldened. It's emboldened. The combined meanings of the names, these five guys. Jehovah has permanently planted those faithful in service to gather the people to form a choir of praise and worship. Wow. That's a, that's a privilege. Listen. Those of you that are that are on, on on the worship team here, that is that is a privilege. That is a calling from heaven. It is a privilege to be separated, to be appointed, to be anointed, for God to cause you to become prophetic and to teach you how to flow and move in the Spirit of God. And then to be able to guide and lead the people of God into deeper and deeper realms or higher and higher realms of worship, however you want to frame it, so that we, we, we truly do come into the presence of God and the presence of God really is actually ushered into our midst so that the entire atmosphere is just filled with him. That's a magnificent privilege. It's a high and holy calling, and not everyone who is a skilled singer or player in the natural is automatically qualified, called, set apart, appointed, and prophetically anointed to be on the team of worshipers before the Lord or his people. Boy, I can't emphasize that enough. Not everybody that has a good voice is a worshiper. Not everybody who can play an instrument 
automatically needs to be on a worship team. I know places where if you walk in the doors and you're able to play an instrument and you make it known that you can play and you're skillful, they'll give you an audition within a week and the next week, within two weeks, you'll be on the platform. Can I tell you something? That ought to never happen. That ought to never, ever happen anywhere. If somebody walks into your midst, I don't care how skilled they are. I don't care how gifted they are. I don't care if it's Jeremiah the prophet who walks in. If I don't know Jeremiah the prophet who walks into, into CFTN up in Indianapolis and I don't know him and I don't know anybody that knows him and he comes in and he walks up to me and he says, to me, hey, brother, listen, I'm a prophet of the Lord and I have a word for this community. I'll tell him, well, that might be, that might be true. But I don't know you. And I don't know anything about your life or your character or where you come from. I don't know anything about your calling, whether you're called as a prophet or whether you have the word of the Lord or you don't. So I'll tell you what. Why don't we spend some time together getting to know each other. And after a season goes by where I get to know you and you get to know me and you become confident with who you are and that you're a safe human being and safe enough to speak the word of God to the people of God, then whatever word you have, it'll wait and it'll hold until then. And that ought to be the law. That ought to be the law and the protocol in every place. Whether it's musicians or prophets or apostles or anybody else. Just because you have a gift or just because you have a skill or an ability doesn't automatically qualify you to do anything. Because everything in the kingdom of God is supposed to be based upon relationship. And the, and the, and the, the model that Jesus used is very simple. And I'll just put it up on the board. It's just very, very simple. It's sons to brothers to friends and then to servant ministers. This is the model that Jesus lived from. This is the model that Jesus taught. You are sons first. That makes you brothers and sisters. That makes you brothers. You are all brothers. And from sons and brothers, we become friends via relationship. And then we get to go do the fun stuff together. But in most places, in most places, <clears throat> the emphasis is all about, forget servant, it's all about being ministers, and forget this, forget this, and forget this. That's the reason why most ministers are the loneliest people that you will ever meet in your life. They are friendless. They have no friends. They have no one to whom they can go when their lives are troubled. They have no one in whom they can confide. No one that they can go say, please pray for me before I go ruin my life. I'm in trouble on the inside. Please help me before I bring devastation to my life, my wife, my family, my kids, and the church of the Lord Jesus. Please save me from myself. Because we have this thing so flipped upside down and so out of order in the body of Christ that it's just absolutely scary. We're sons first to the Father, and we're all brothers and sisters. The basis of everything that is done in the kingdom of God is brotherhood. It's the basis of everything. If you see your brother sin, well, what if that brother happens to be a leader? 
Jesus didn't care if he's a leader. He didn't care if he's the Apostle Peter or the Apostle Paul. He doesn't care who he may be by way of ministry or calling. If you see your brother sin, go to your brother and reprove him in private. He, why? What's the basis upon which I go to my brother? He's your brother. He's a son to the Father just like you are. You go to your brother. If you care about your brother, you go tell your brother, hey, I don't know, maybe I was imagining things, I don't know, but I'm not really deaf or blind yet, but I think when I walked outside the building on Sunday, I overheard you cussing and hollering and screaming at your wife in the parking lot just before the two of you dove into your car to drive away like a mad dog when I saw you, you know, burning rubber out of the parking lot. And I just want to know from you as my brother, have you repented yet? Because if you haven't repented yet, I don't even know what you guys were fighting about. All I know is that you probably wouldn't talk to any other woman in the kingdom of God like I heard you talking to your wife the other day. Amen. Would you? So if you wouldn't talk to any other sister or woman in the kingdom of God the way you were talking to your wife, why do you think you can get away with talking to her that way when she's a daughter to the living God and Father? Amen. And I'm here to just ask you, brother, have you repented yet? And if you get and you just expect to push back, maybe expect a punch in the nose, maybe expect to roll around in the grass a little while, just expect it because men are just stupid anyway, Amen. and they just want to fight about anything. And so if you get in their stuff, they're the first one to say, Well, who do you think you are talking to me? Well, who do I think I am? I know who I am. I'm your brother, and you're my brother, and I love you too much to not tell you this. Amen. I love you too much to not get in your face. And listen, if you don't go and repent, I got some buddies, because if you beat me up, I got a couple of brothers that are bigger than me, and I'm going to bring them. And then if you beat all of us up, I'm going to bring the whole church to your front door. That's what we're going to do. So I just want to know, did you repent to your wife yet? Because you can't talk to her that way. Or whatever. Listen, I've gone to guys' houses where they, their wives and children showed up on my front door. You know, they showed up on my front door, you know, they, whatever. They got no shoes on. They, they, they ran out of the house. And they're like, oh my God, oh my God. What are you doing? Well, you know, he went crazy. He did this, he did that. I'm like, whoa, really? Well, where is he now? Oh, right, he's still at the house. Oh, it's, okay, well, I go get my keys and I get in my car. Here I go. And I'm driving just as straight to, I'm driving straight to the house. I don't need to pray about that. I don't need to ask the Father, well, what is your will here? I already know the will of God. The will of God is he's my brother. He's nuts right now, and I need to go help him out. That's what I know. Because if you leave your brother in his sin, or you leave your sister in her sin. Well, oh, don't get me started about the girls. Oh. Lord Jesus. <clears throat> Let me just talk to you about this for prayer, please. I'm going to share this thing with you. Did you know that? And then off they go. And off they go. Oh, well, I need to call. I need to call. I need to call Erica and tell her to. Erica. If Erica's got any character and any sense at all, as soon as she hears the first couple of words of that nonsense happening, you know what she says? She says, you know what? I don't participate in gossip and in malice. Come on. And I'm here to tell you that I don't want to hear that. And not only that, I'm here to rebuke you for what you're doing. And that you're in your sin. 
and you need to repent. And any, wherever you got that from, you need to call her back and tell her that you're sorry for listening to her. And then you need to reprove her. And we need to put an end to this nonsense that's going on in this community. And I'm here to help you do it. And if you don't do it, I got some other sisters that are going to come show up at your doorstep and we're all going to talk to you. That's church life. That's real Christianity. Wow. Number six, and involve participating people. 28. <clears throat> Thus all Israel brought up. <clears throat> well, let me look at verse 27. What? 850. Does that mean you're going to get the hook in 10 minutes? Okay. Verse 27. Let's see. Now David was... <laughs> Uh, now David was clothed with a robe of fine linen with all the Levites what? who were carrying the ark and the singers and Kenaniah Jehovah has planted the leader of the singing the what? the leader of the singing with the singers David also wore an ephod, ephod of linen twice in one verse it says and emphasizes clothed with a robe of fine linen and wore an ephod of linen. The only people who dressed like that were priests. Right. Wait a minute. David is from the tribe of Judah. David is not from the tribe of Levi. He's not a priest. And yet he dresses up not like a king, but he dresses up like a priest. Now, we're getting some really prophetic stuff going on here with David. Because what you're ending up having here is you're having somebody who is the king, but who now also is a priest. Come on. And you got a king and a priest, and a priest is a king. And a king who's a priest, and a priest is a king. And in the Old Testament, there was only one other person in the entire Old Testament that was both a king and a priest. And that person is Melchizedek. Oh, and don't you know, the writer to the Hebrews has a whole bunch to say about Melchizedek in chapters 5 through 7 of Hebrews. He mentions Melchizedek and the order of Melchizedek seven times in chapters 5 through 7. Seven times he mentions it. In fact, he goes on to say, does the writer to the Hebrews, that this person, Melchizedek, is the single greatest person in the entire Old Testament. <coughs> if you take notes, you can write that down. You can write that down and you can put it to the biblical test. That's exactly what he says. Because if he is greater than Abraham, which he is, And he was the one to whom Abraham paid tithes. And he is the one who blessed Abraham. Then the one who is paid tithes to is greater than the one who pays tithes. That's what the writer says in chapter 7. And the one who blesses is greater than the one who is blessed. That's what it also says. Then he's greater than Abraham. And who comes out of Abraham? Isaac. Jacob, the 12 tribes of Israel, one of them being Judah, so he's greater than whoever comes out of Judah, which happens to be David. He's greater than anybody else. Moses, who comes out of Levi, he's greater than Moses. He's greater than Aaron. He's greater than Daniel. He's greater than all the prophets. He's the single greatest person in the entire Old Testament, and yet you only have three verses about him in the entire Old Testament with the exception of the most quoted psalm in the entire Bible which is Psalm 110 Psalm 110 is the most quoted psalm in the entire Bible and what is it about it's about this king who will also be a priest who is a, a priest forever according to the order of you know, that. that's what David did and I'm going to tell you what I think. I think that, that it was after David dressed up like a priest. And he realized that, that he was a priest and a king on a day. 
where the ark of God came up, I believe that it was then that he had the revelation about the order of Melchizedek and that God was going to send someone that was going to sit upon his throne, who was going to be king, who was also going to be a priest according to the order of Melchizedek. And that's why he wrote Psalm 110, and I believe it came after David did this very thing. Thus all Israel brought up the ark of the covenant of the Lord with shouting, the sound of the horn, trumpets, loud sounding cymbals, harps, and lyres. And then there's King David and his wife Michael. And she saw King David leaping and making merry, and she despised him in her heart. And there's a whole you know, message that can be preached about all of that. <clears throat> they brought in the ark of God and placed it inside the tent, which David had pitched for it. They offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before God. And when David had finished offering burnt offerings and peace offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord. And he appointed some of the Levites as ministers before the ark to celebrate and give thanks and praise to the Lord God of Israel. And then, if you'll just turn with me quickly to chapter 25. Just eight verses. <clears throat> and involved participating people. Israel brought up the ark of the covenant with shouting. Horns, trumpets, cymbals, harps, and lyres. What David envisioned was precisely this. An involved and participating people as a whole, even as one man. Listen, the days of... Um, People being up on the platform, putting on a show and entertaining the people of God who are non-participating, those days are over. God wants his people to be one and he wants us to participate together in all that he's doing. And so, under David's prophetic, kingly, and priestly direction, and under the leadership of the appointed worshiping priest, the people of God celebrated and worshiped the God of Israel Right in his very presence. It was something completely new and radical. The processional was astounding with David himself at the forefront in the lead, clothed in a linen ephod as a king priest, Psalm 110, from the tribe of Judah. Then came the elders of Israel, then the captains of Israel, the high priests, Zadok and Abiathar, the chief priests and Levites, then the trumpeters before the ark in their midst. Then the doorkeepers or porters, the singers, and then the players and musicians behind them, along with the damsels or the women dancers with their timbrels and tambourines who danced in and out among the singers and musicians, and then the tribes of Israel following in procession with shouts of joyous celebration, all headed toward Mount Zion to the tabernacle David had pitched for the ark. Wow. Ordered but spontaneous. Then lastly, an officiating, overseeing, sacrificing king and priest. It sounds like Melchizedek to me. David is a type of his own future king priest according to the order of Melchizedek. The Lord Jesus Christ, who is actually his son according to the flesh. He performs both the duty of king and priest in leading his people and offering blood sacrifices to his God as well as providing nourishment for the people. He prescribes all of the order and direction for the worship in the tabernacle. He alone is in charge, and is, it is out of David as the source that the presence of God is ushered into the midst of the people. He himself is a type of Christ Jesus, and obviously there's so much more we can't get to right now. So then Jesus himself is one, the king of righteousness and peace. He is the great high priest according to the order of Melchizedek forever. I appreciated Erica tonight when she was singing, saying, our high priest, our high priest, leading us into the presence of the Father. Jesus as our high priest, who stands in the presence of the Father when we show up. He's the one that takes us to the Father as the great high priest. Wow. So much to say. He's the testator, the mediator, the guarantor, the intercessor, and advocate of the new covenant. And he is a worshiping minister, servant in the true tabernacle of heaven. We are joining in the presence of those with the harps and bowls before the Lamb and the throne of the Father as one, a kingdom and priests. Not a kingdom of priests, 
a kingdom and priests, a holy priesthood, a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a possessed people, and a worshiping kingdom, priesthood, race, nation, people of the true tabernacle in heaven, and we are a future ruling, reigning with them, royal priesthood. May the God and Father of our Lord Jesus give to all of us a spirit of wisdom and revelation and to the full, accurate, thorough knowledge of himself, his son, his purposes for restoring the tabernacle of David. I've given you some scriptures. Um, one thing that I do want to read is down the bottom of the next page, uh, near, or near the bottom, where uh, we have, we must distinguish, and I want to just emphasize this. We must distinguish between songs that are about us and who we are in Him and songs that are about all He has done and songs that are about Him and who He is and songs that are directed to Him and the beauty of His person and His holiness. We must know the differences between thanksgiving, praise, and true worship of Him. Amen. The vast majority of songs that you will hear in most places are songs about either what, who and what we are in Him or about what He has done for us. And I'm not saying we shouldn't sing that. Those, it's fine to sing that. But that's not worship. That's thanksgiving. It might be praise, but then there are songs that are about him and who he is. But they're not actually directed to him. True worship are songs that we sing, melodies that we make, the new song that comes out of our heart that is directed right toward him, himself. And I want you to know that the Lord himself knows the difference between those songs. And he pays attention to them. And therefore, um, um, let's see, only experiential knowledge of him is truly transformational. Experiential knowledge that truly transforms us requires Encountering him in face-to-face -face meetings with his person and presence, whether in prayer and intercession, or in the meditation of the word, or in praise, or especially in worship and adoration. We require his presence to change or transform us, and we need only gaze upon his glory and be captured and enraptured by his loving and heart-penetrating gaze looking into us to be transformed into the same image and be translated from one phase or dimension, realm, and expression of his glory into another. In the hidden inner man of the heart by the Spirit who is the Lord himself in us. The Lord says, seek my face. And our hearts should say like David did. Your face, O Lord, will I see. Mm. I, I trust that um, the Lord will um, continue to bring you all as a people and take you deeper and deeper um, into his own person and into his presence. Um, we, need to, we need to make a clear distinction between um, going after him, <laughs> excuse me, going after him for an experience, <clears throat> going after him for what we can get out of him in the experience and going after him just for him. Just for him. And so I just want to encourage you and I, I thank you all for coming out on these three nights and for being patient with me and sharing. There's a lot more here obviously that uh, we didn't get to in chapter 25 about prophetic worship, but you have the passage. You can go back and read it for yourselves. And hopefully God will continue to uh, enlighten all of your hearts. So, Father, thank you for this precious people of yours. 
Thank you for uh, Jeremiah and for Barry who invited me to come. Uh, thank you for Erica and Brandon and for Tim and for the demonstration uh, of these things that we've just been talking about and teaching and sharing, that they brought um, substance and reality to uh, the things that we're talking about. What a marvelous God you are. Father, what timing do you have for this place to um, birth something that is rich and that is deep and that is real in your heart, something that you have longed to do in the restoration of David's tabernacle. So I'm asking that you would make this place the light that you want it to be. That people would be drawn here because they know that when they walk through the doors, they are going to encounter you in truth. Keep this place pure, Father. Purify it even more. Sanctify these who are, who are your people and your priests in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. I know I can speak for Barry as well as myself, but, you know, you're at heart of the Father, but we're learning about is our highest desire. We want and deeply desire to see the name of Jesus lifted up in Lakeland through Heart of the Father ministry that people could fix their eyes on Jesus and not man. I really believe that the ruling principality in this region is the spirit of religion. The spirit of religion is focused on man in the way that we will defeat the religious spirit is the worship of Jesus. Corey Russell prophesied it the first time he was, he was here and it was like fire in my spirit and it's never left. I really believe that the way of revival and awakening in this city is not about a man, not about a ministry, but about the God man, Jesus Christ. And if we will give ourselves to creating a space and a place for him, to move, we won't miss it. But there are so many detours and distractions along the way that you and I are going to have to fight for. You know, it's one thing for 30 of us to gather in a room and want the presence and want the person, but what happens when a hundred more show up that could care less? If you've ever been here on a Sunday, that's the tension. Maybe five or ten of us we want Jesus, but who knows what everybody else is here for. I really believe that every time we gather, it's up to you and I to shift the atmosphere and create change. It's about us getting in that prayer room before service. I, I know so many people that just show up and want it to happen, and it ain't ever going to happen unless you get involved. So many people know the answer, but they don't want to be the answer. I'm asking for your help in these things. It's literally the worship time. I really believe this last thing. The worship team always feeds off the crowd. And the crowd feeds off the worship team. It's not just about a worship team getting Jesus centered. It's about the crowd getting Jesus centered. It's going to take every one of us. So bless you guys again. Thank you for your time. I know it's precious. I know it's a sacrifice to be out here. We'll be here Thursday night. We'll do worship. I'll preach a message that the Lord's put on our heart for us. And uh, if anything else, we'll see you Sunday morning. God bless you guys. Be sure to...